Thank you so much, Jana. What a terrific conversation. Thank you for joining us live from Berlin. So the European Union is unique among international institutions. It has an extraordinary ability to set norms and standards, to develop regulations that change the face of industries, and to reimagine how to use power in a global system, as we just heard. So together, the European Union, the United States, are doing even more by helping to set global norms and standards. But sometimes there are debates within the transatlantic community about how to prioritize different policies, sometimes different values. No one expects the European Union and the United States to agree on everything. But we can acknowledge that even when opinions diverge, if we can, we're stronger together. One area of continued debate is security and defense. The transatlantic relationship is not purely a collective defense alliance, though that is certainly one of the most important pillars of the transatlantic bond. It does serve as one of the most influential elements of the relationship, and it fosters both impressive acts of coordination and passionate debates. Absolutely, Denise. We have a lot of those at the Atlantic Council. We were able to achieve much together because we worked in tandem. That's so clear. And despite disagreements and debates, that stands truer than ever in a more complex and more dangerous world. That's the premise of our conversations these three days. So now I wanna to turn to Elena Kutsko, director of the GlobeSec Policy Institute, who's gonna moderate our next discussion on exactly these issues. How do we strengthen Europe's role in transatlantic security? Elena Hells from Bratislava, where we have a strategic partnership with GlobeSec. We're proud of that partnership here at the Atlanta Council. Elena, over to you. Welcome everyone and greetings from Bratislava. Thank you, our friends at the Atlantic Council for holding this forum. It is my pleasure to guide you through our next session, strengthening Europe's role in transatlantic security. As we just heard, the case for a stronger Europe in transatlantic defense and security has become resounding in the past decade. However, we still have a lot of work to do to reach a shared understanding on the scope of European ambition, the pace of ambition measured against reality, of course, and the practical path forward for transatlantic allies. We have an impressive panel today to reflect on these issues. I'm honored to open the conversation with Max Bergman, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress, Natalie Lozo, Chair of the Subcommittee on Security and Defense at the European Parliament, representing Renew Europe France, and Anna Wieslander, who is Director, Northern Europe at the Atlantic Council. As a warm up, let's try to have a brief definition of the concept that's been very heatedly debated, strategic autonomy. Natalie Lozo, I'll go first to you. What do Europeans mean when they say strategic autonomy? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, directly trying to answer your question. I would say that strategic autonomy sounds like good news. This is European willingness to become a relevant and reliable security provider, uh, working with allies every time it can and uh, working autonomously whenever it has to, because we may have our own priorities or our own challenges, which may not be shared by allies or sometimes contradicted by allies, like it happened, for instance, in the recent uh, months and years with Turkey in East Med or in Libya. Um, and uh, this was the definition of uh, 2016 global strategy. Uh, but recently with the pandemic, uh, this notion of strategic autonomy became wider we know that we are too dependent on and too vulnerable technologically, industrially uh, towards some powers which might not be friendly, uh, namely uh, China. And the appropriate answer to this kind of challenge is more a union like the European Union with the vast range of instruments that we have than simply a military alliance. So this is not contradictory with NATO. This is not against the United States. This is a strong pillar of a transatlantic partnership. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'll jump straight to Max, who is sitting at the other side of the Atlantic. Max, uh, Natalie says strategic autonomy is good news. What do Americans think when they hear European strategic autonomy? Well, I, I think they're kind of confused. Uh, and I think haven't 
spent a lot of time uh, thinking about what uh, strategic autonomy means. I think there's some concern uh, that this may mean uh, going against NATO. And I think, you know, Washington has sort of been, I think, stuck very much in the 1990s. We're seeing the EU uh, as somewhat of a competitor to NATO when NATO didn't seem to have a real mission or purpose uh, in the 1990s and Washington was concerned about its future. But to me, strategic autonomy is essentially Europe being able to act uh, independently and on its own without needing the United States. And I think that's something Washington should actually embrace. And just you know, one quick example, uh, when I was in the State Department uh, and there was a, a French need to intervene uh, in, in Africa, uh, the French needed US military capabilities to provide air refueling, to provide uh, ISR. And we had to provide this as if it were sort of as if we were providing assistance to a developing country. And these are the sort of capabilities that I think we should encourage Europe to develop so they don't have to come to the United States uh, or, or don't rely on the United States to operate militarily. Uh, and I think I think that's that's how I think Europeans should should pose this to the United States. It's actually Europe stepping up. Thank you so much, Max. It is probably also a good time to reflect on the recent news that might help us shed some light on this confusion. Right before the forum, it was announced that the United States is joining the PESCO project on military mobility. This announcement was heralded as a sign that the Biden administration is receptive to use defense ambition and sees tangible value in projects organized within the EU framework. I have a question for Anna Wieslander. Should we read this announcement as an illustration of a convergence between the EU and US in understanding what European strategic autonomy is about? Yes, I think that's this is a really positive sign. It's a great sign, the US doing this alongside of Canada and Norway, uh, using the ability of third states to participate in EU projects. And military mobility is exactly one of these projects where NATO and the EU needs to cooperate. Uh, it's a flagship uh, project that will enable reinforcements and readiness along the eastern flank, but you need the EU, its infrastructure, its legislation in order to make that work. So I think what we see here is the Biden administration um, approaching uh, the issue of strategic autonomy, which is a confusing term also among EU member states, as a question of responsibility sharing and developing burden sharing. And I think that's the right approach uh, to see that, how can we work together? Uh, that's how we should see European defense, actually. This is about responsibility sharing in a very challenging world setting marked by increasing uh, great power competition. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'll go back to Natalie Lozo. The discussion on European strategic autonomy in Europe has often faced criticism that the practical dimension lags behind the theoretical debate. It is good to have ambition, but the proof is in the pudding. If we talk about tangible deliverables, what milestones and practical steps you would like to see in the upcoming months that would demonstrate measurable progress towards a more capable Europe? Actually, we've started uh, walking the walk after talking the talk, and I think it's more interesting to uh, practice uh, strategic autonomy than to discuss about it uh, for years. Um, we started in a weird way, as the European Union always does. We started with building instruments, and now we are thinking about the reasons why we should use these instruments. Uh, we have money. Uh, to have uh, common efforts on capabilities. This is the European Defence Fund, which was voted in the European Parliament uh, some days ago. Uh, we have PESCO projects, as mentioned, and military mobility is a flagship project. This is uh, an incentive to have more cooperation and more investment uh, from uh, member states in research development in capabilities as well. And uh, we have missions and operations uh, outside Europe. We have a number of them, but their mandates uh, and sometimes their staffing are still uh, a little weak and we have to go further. Now we are engaged in a very important and interesting process, which we call our strategic compass. This is discussing uh, how we assess threats together. This was done uh, and this was really useful and informative and, and informative. And how do we answer to these threats together? And we see that there are more and more uh, challenges which are hybrid. 
uh, cyber attacks, uh, disinformation, in which we need all our European instruments to address these challenges. And of course, we work on our partnership, uh, NATO being the most important of them, but not the only one. And we have to make progress uh, in all these directions. It sounds very ambitious, and we have to live up to these ambitions. Uh, but I think that there is awareness, there is both a sense of relief that the transatlantic partnership is uh, on the good rails now, and also a sense of urgency, because challenges and threats around Europe are bigger than ever. Thank you so much. We see that indeed a lot of is happening in the European Union when it comes to defense and security. But I also want to connect your point about the sense of relief uh, uh, connected to the new administration in Washington DC and transatlantic relations and go with it to, back to Max. Max, as you pointed out before in your work, especially under the Trump administration, the, EU dem the U.S. demonstrated almost dogmatic opposition to the EU's involvement in defense and security. Do you see a, some kind of a paradigm shift in the White House connected to the attitude towards the European Union? And in your calls to embrace the EU as a security ally, what is the elevator pitch of the EU's added value? Well, I think the, the elevator pitch is that the EU, the size of the EU and the size of its economy uh, is the same as the United States and China. It's essentially a, another major economic pillar. Um, and so if we're looking to cooperate on climate, on trade, on technology, the, the EU is the, the, our fundamental ally, and especially in a time when the United States is, is not as strong as it once was. It, we need powerful allies particularly uh, as we sort of deal with competition with China. Um, and I also think that the EU is a source of, is a, a theater for geopolitical competition where Russia and China seek to divide Europe, seek to cultivate relationships with uh, various European actors and want Europe to be, be weak. We should want Europe to be strong. Um, and I think when it comes to the Biden administration, I think there's a recognition of this being the case. But I think for 20 plus years, the United States has viewed the EU very skeptically. We've not quite understood it, literally don't quite understand how it's structured. It's a new form of, of political organization. We're used to dealing with states. And so I think there's a, a real, you know, you don't sort of turn the, the aircraft carrier right away. There's a real learning curve that I think uh, exists in, in particularly in the State Department where we've dealt with the EU in a kind of hands-off skeptical manner and, 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 and not dealt with it, I think, in a strategic way. And I think that's beginning to shift with the Biden administration, I think the US-EU summit uh, should pro uh, provide a real venue for, to, to, to put that on display. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, Natalie and Max already touched upon a little bit about the broadening definition of uh, the concept of security per se, and uh, the increasingly wide range of challenges that we have to address. Anna, I want to talk to you a little bit about the impact of pandemic on transatlantic security. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the discussions on security and defense acquired an extra level of complexity in addition to all the challenges that we have already had. Of course, it includes concerns about the budgetary allocations given the financial pressures, but it also further reframes the very definition of security and the ways it should be provided. What is your view on how the pandemic changes transatlantic security strategy? I think both uh, Natalie and Max uh, have touched upon uh, the most uh, important trends, you can say. I think it has accelerated trends that we have seen already. So when it comes to autonomy, those discussions are uh, a lot broader now than they were previously, uh, connected to uh, supply chains, connected to uh, health, connected to cyber uh, and so on. Um, and there it is not directed, um, as we said, only again, it's not in relationship to the US, but, but uh, a lot is about China, the vulnerability of global supply chains. And uh, I think what's important now for, for Europe is to see that this is not about you know, uh, protectionism, 
uh, in that sense, but it's about more of a comprehensive security approach, perhaps, to be more resilient uh, and to look at you know, smart ways of, of becoming more resilient in still a globalized world. So, because otherwise we will lose a lot of our prosperity and, and uh, I mean, EU builds on trade and open borders and, and we want to keep it that way, but still you would have to look at, for instance, uh, production to keep perhaps some, some sites for, for some crucial production uh, possibilities um uh, natural resources for instance the diversity of, of the flows uh, storage and so on so these are part of what we in sweden during the cold war talked about a comprehensive security approach a total societal uh, approach of of, uh, of uh, security and i think that goes for both nations but also at the eu level we see more of how we can use europe as a playing field for storage of, of critical um, products uh, and materials, for instance. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, the acceleration of, of the global power competition with China and Russia being very active towards the EU. So the cohesion question is very important. And that's also very important from the transatlantic point of view. What's, what Max was his pitch here on, you know, we are on the same side. So in that way, Europe is not hedging in between the US and, and China, for instance. We are, when it comes to cohesion of, of values, for instance, definitely on the same side. And this has accelerated as well, I think, the unity, uh, the sense of a shared destiny for democracies and for the free and open world, in contrast to increasingly authoritarian uh, regimes and how they use even these kind of vulnerabilities that are apparent during a pandemic. That's really a crucial lesson, I think. Indeed, the complexity of the European Union might seem befuddling, but this very complexity might come very handy when we're talking about the complex challenges and the ways to address them. I'll go to Natalie Lozo with the next question. We talk a lot about that Europe needs to take greater responsibility, and there seems to be at least the conceptual understanding that we need to move in this direction. But it does not seem to be a smooth, sail, smooth sailing, at least not in all European countries. In some countries, let's say in Germany, it's perceived like a break with the past. In many other countries, uh, there is a need to redefy and rethink their threat assessment in Europe to be more aligned with allies. Is Europe prepared to do more on defense and security? Well, excellent questions, of course. Uh, I would say that, um, the exercise of threat analysis that we've done uh, a few months ago was extremely useful because everyone came with its own priorities and concerns and shared it with others without prioritizing or without trying to uh, uh, make a, a common paper out of it. So um, it showed that uh, this uh, usual way of seeing Europe with some uh, having more concerns about their, the eastern flank and others about uh, the southern neighborhood and some having concerns with nothing uh, is basically outdated. Uh, terrorism, um, uh, cyber attacks, uh, no new borders and everybody realizes that it can be a target. But still, uh, there are differences and you mentioned one of the two elephants in the room, which is Germany. Germany, because of history, because of its constitution, uh, because of its political uh, landscape, uh, is still reluctant to engage more in security mm. in the uh, hard way uh, uh, about it. And it might still be difficult uh, when we see the Greens getting higher in the polls, we need to have a conversation uh, and talk about realities that uh, deserve serious answers. The other elephant is not far away from the room and it's the UK. Uh, because uh, it has been a, a very serious security provider within the European Union. Now it's outside of the EU and very reluctant to engage into anything serious with the European Union for reasons related to, I would say, politics and symbols. But to my view, this is not reasonable. Uh, there are things that we will not be able to um, import in NATO for a number of reasons and that we have to address between the US and the EU and between the UK and the EU and especially on hybrid threats. And I really 
hope that the British authorities will change their mind, get out of uh, slogans, and realize that there is a need to work seriously on a number of threats and challenges. Global Britain doesn't mean Britain turning its back to its closest neighbors. Jumping on the second elephant in the room, the United Kingdom, I want to go back to Anna, who's written extensively on how the UK can work with Germany and France and, of course, others on moving forward the European security. Anna, how do we bring in the UK? Well, I think at the moment, I mean, the UK, uh, as, as the leading military power of, of Europe, is outside of the EU, and that's important to recognize. They are inside of NATO. So here we need to find, and at the same time as we heard, increasing ambitions within, within the EU for, for defense and security. So we need to, to align these uh, things and work together towards a more of a, a European pillar in, in NATO, meaning more of, of taking on burdens and responsibility, but within the same team, so to say, as the US, uh, the same framework. Uh, and here we have a consultation mechanism, which is informal between the UK, France and Germany, which is called the E3. It has mostly been used um, within the Iran deal and, and, and afterwards there, but it has expanded now. And I think that as an avant-garde uh, in order to kind of calibrate uh, various initiatives, as we have heard within the EU on defense, there are other um, uh, formats that are uh, engaging uh, groups of countries on defense, uh, French initiative, uh, EI2, and there are there is the uh, Northern Group and the uh, Joint Expeditionary Force uh, within the UK, for instance. Germany has a framework nation concept that they are pushing, and there are several others. Uh, so we need to have some kind of idea how to move forward on this without losing the, the larger framework and without having unnecessary duplications uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, costly solutions for many countries in the EU, uh, EU uh, who are uh, smaller nations, middle or smaller sized nations. You really need to think about those aspects as well as we, as we have a more challenging uh, environment to navigate in. So more of a congruence between the EU and NATO, but also between uh, smaller and bigger countries. Thank you so much, Anna. I want to go back to Max uh, with another element that was mentioned before, and that's this concept of which threats are outdated uh, and uh, what are our forward-looking assessments of security realities and our preparedness for them. In his recent address, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin outlined his vision of the concept of integrated deterrence. Against the backdrop of changes in warfare defined by new technologies, he highlighted the urgent need for the US to invest in the emerging technologies, develop new operational concepts, and of course, redefine what capabilities we need. The UK that we just discussed also had recently its integrated review and put strong emphasis on the emerging technologies. Uh, how do we adjust transatlantic security cooperation in accordance with these new concepts and realities? And what can the EU bring to the table here? So it's, it's a great question. And I think this is, you know, in some ways, because Europe has underinvested in defense, I think there's a, a real opportunity for significant for Europe to be a leader when it comes to innovation, and particularly rethinking, um, in, in some ways, rethinking the structure of its defense forces. I think the challenge is that the current structure of the European defense industrial landscape is, is, is not conducive to this sort of innovation because it's done very much on a, a, a national basis, not on a European basis. And this is where I think um, developing new financing tools at NATO uh, we've thrown out the idea through the Atlantic Council and, and a report at the Center for American Progress on a NATO bank. And I think part of NATO's 2030 proposals are to create sort of financing so you can invest in startups and in, in other innovation. Uh, and I think part of this is that increased industrial collaboration uh, between the US, uh, UK and EU should be something that we really look at uh, uh, on a NATO lens. But I think the EU also has a fundamental role here in working to sort of integrate the defense industrial capacity uh, uh, on the defense side within the European Union, which currently is, is sort of less than the sum of its parts. 
Thank you, Max. And I want to go back again to Natalie with a similar question, because I know that EU has been trying hard with the European Defense Funds. Of course, there are arguments whether it's sufficient or not, and there are national contributions. Natalie, what's your vision on the uh, EU's contribution to the development of new technologies in the defense and security domain? Well, there is no doubt that we have to do more, uh, and now there is real awareness about it. So uh, we decided to dedicate uh, 8 billion euros to uh, encourage uh, countries and companies to work together. Uh, there has to be at least three companies from three different countries, uh, big groups and also SMEs and also startups working together, which will make a change in this very di divided landscape of uh, European defense industry. And I think it's good news. Thank you, Max, for saying that when you're late, sometimes you're, you're new and fresh in, in innovation. Um, well, it happened, you remember, with Galileo. We started late. It, it took time, and actually Galileo is a very important and, and serious instrument, which is no uh, duplication of GPS, but, but can complement and support GPS when need be. So this is what we will try to do. We have to focus on our operational needs, and we have to focus on uh, innovation. It also provides jobs uh, and uh, competitiveness to uh, the European Union at a moment where we need more countries of the free world with democratic values and support for human rights uh, working on defense and security. Because if you do, we don't do it, others will do. Uh, and others are doing it, uh, Russia and China, uh, for instance. So we have to be present in the game and we are trying to do it. But security and defense, as we already mentioned, is not only about uh, defense industry per se, and what we are doing, for instance, in the control of foreign investment in strategic sectors is maybe as important as the rest. And this is really something on which we have made a lot of progress. We, we left the uh, era of naivete uh, and are becoming more realistic. And we have about three minutes left, so I will try to squeeze in one question to all three of you. What do you think is missing in the discussion on the way forward on enhancing Europe's role in transatlantic security? We talked a lot about what Europe should do, so please feel free to also add what the United States should do to enhance Europe's role. Anna, would you like to go first? Well, thank you. Uh, well, top of mind for me is, is to have more of a constructive dialogue on, on burden sharing and who does what actually, and, and to be focusing more on what unites us than what divides us uh, and, and to have that kind of approach to it. But I think, uh, and I'm not thinking only of capabilities and so on, what's lacking. I'm thinking a lot of the diplomatic efforts actually, as we see uh, in, in Europe's neighborhood, for instance, we have a, a you know, sparking range of conflicts uh, going on. So, you know, can we have more of a substantive uh, discussion with the US, who takes the lead, where and what on diplomatic means, who supports us, you know, where, where does we back up? So we have more of a congruence on, on what actually to do and how to act because we have uh, quite, quite a lot of means uh, if we want to, but sometimes the political will is, is lacking or we are not united in what we want to achieve. Uh, and I think this is uh, what I would like to see uh, top of mind during the Biden administration years, because I think we have an opportunity now to work together if, if we have this approach uh, from both sides. Thank you so much, Anna. Max, over to you. So I think the main thing is the U.S. needs to shift its approach toward the EU. You know, if the U.S. had spent the last 20 years pushing the EU to do more on defense, to integrate def its, its defense forces, I think we'd be in a very different place. Uh, and the name of the game, I think, is European defense integration, pooling of resources, uh, merging capabilities, and to view the EU not as a competitor to NATO, but as fundamentally a, a crucial pillar of NATO. And we need to get out of this game of, of worrying about duplication. What is duplication? It's essentially a bureaucratic concern. It's very minor in the, in the whole larger scheme of things and something that we can just deal with. So I think it's really about Pushing European defense integration is the main thing the United States should really encourage uh, going forward over the next two decades. Thank you so much, Max. And Natalie, back to you for the final words. 
Thank you. I would say that uh, the US needs to redefine what an ally means. An ally is not a competitor. An ally is not a customer. An ally uh, does not steal your leadership. An ally is someone uh, uh, that you can uh, ask for help when you need it and uh, which uh, you consider uh, in, a, in a respectful dialogue. We need to be more relevant and we are struggling to become so. Uh, and there is maybe one thing that I would love to uh, hear disappearing from our conversations. This is the word burden in burden sharing. Our security is not a burden, it's a shared responsibility. Thank you so much, uh, panelists. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, thank you for this enlightening conversation and to the Atlantic Council for organizing it. And thank you to all of you for watching. Thank you. Thank you.